We stand before you, trying to let this um, time go past, and that way everything will be okay. Uh, you guys, I want y'all to really, 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 really uh focus right now. We all have to. I always say all hands on deck. But more than anything, there's so many wars that are going on. Um, biological, chemical. I mean, it, it's amazing. Um, there's some information, though, I just got to get off today. And I'm hoping that we can... Um, all take you know, what we do is serious. I know a lot of people want me to make a comment on the Tasha K, uh, the content creator, the con where is it? and the Cardi B. If I was to make any kind con uh, comment on that as a as a creator, um. I think we all have a responsibility to make sure that, um, you know, what we say is accurate. Um, having a little misstep or something because, you know, sometimes your age get the best of you and you might say, um, you know, uh, the bone crusher as opposed to the crusher wrestler. Those little things are acceptable um, mistakes. Um, I think sometimes when you are out here uh, disseminating information to many of millions of people, you know, you, you have to be a little more responsible. And it's just that simple. And like I said, I'm not taking any sides because um, I, I, I like Tasha. I was, I've seen her content. Uh, she reminds me of a cousin. And we all got somebody in our family like Tasha. So, uh, but like I said, there's a certain amount of responsibility that's got to go along with all of this. As a content creator, I wish um, we do take that uh, a little serious. So, uh, moving on from that. Uh, all right. Moving on from that. What I want to talk about today, you guys, and I know y'all probably saying what, is the devastating um, effect that um, Jeffrey Dahmer had on our damn city. Because, you know, we still are suffering from the effects of Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay? And I want y'all to know that because a lot of y'all... You know, it's out of sight, out of mind. But I'm going to take a few minutes and I'm going to take, it's going to be a, a pretty lengthy video. Because I want to talk about this crazy motherfucker and some of the people that he damaged, um, people that I know and Milwaukee. Because a lot of y'all sleeping on Milwaukee. A lot of y'all think Milwaukee is like Laverne and Shirley. You know what I'm saying? The bowling, beer brats and bowling and shit. But it's not. It is such a city uh, riven in poverty for black people. Most black people here are on Section 8. Okay? Um, and if you look at the worst place in America for black people to live, I'm sure Milwaukee has got to be in the top two. Okay? So I'm going to give you a, a just like, my, my parents migrated to uh, Milwaukee in the 50s. Okay, so I'm a first generation of a, a Milwaukee, all right, from my family. And my father, people were from Gary. And my mother was from, like, again, St. Louis. But they migrated to get away from the uh, stuff in those 
respective places. My father was from Pop from Missouri, Poplar Bluff. And then they came on to uh they was uh uh to Milwaukee looking for a better way. And my father just did not want to work in the steel mill. He said it was hard, hard work. But he came here and he worked at Patrick Cuddyhay. Okay. So, but Milwaukee has always been a little uh, on the edge, if you know the history of Milwaukee. Um, it's a socialist city. Uh, um, we were known for socialist mayors um, and like Mayor Meyer Zeidler, who lived up the street from me. He just passed away a couple of years ago. We called him the mayor. That's who he was. He lived right in the hood. But Milwaukee was also known for that damn Jeffrey Dahmer and the 17 people that he killed. The cannibal, monster, freaking bastard that he was. And it's really weird because the lead detective in that case, Kennedy, was the one who um, was also the lead detective in my sister's murder. So, um, like I said, I, I'm a, a lifelong Milwaukee resident, and I have a lot of, um, even though I've moved and lived different places, there's a lot of history um, in Milwaukee that I have in terms of um, civil rights and all that stuff, okay? Because we participated in all of it. My father made it. But y'all know that he was born um, in 1960, right, in Milwaukee. Uh, he was born to Lionel and Joyce Dahmer. And for all accounts, they say he was a happy child, right? Now, I heard his mother was on a lot of psychotropic drugs, okay? And it said it was not until the age of six, after he underwent a hernia surgery, that all his personality uh, began to change from a jubilant social child to a loner who was uncommunicative and withdrawn. I don't freaking believe that. You know, I don't believe he had no damn hernia surgery. Then all of a sudden he turned to a damn serial killer because that's where you're going with this. And this is what white people do. OK, they always trying to uh, get a backbone and some sympathy for, um, you know, their kind and their kind in this case being a goddamn cannibal. Um, his facial expressions transformed from sweet childish smiles to a blank emotionless stare that remained with him throughout his life. Mm -hmm. His mama was on psychotropic drugs. Okay. His father was an engineer. His mother had a lot of emotional and mental problems that, um, that probably was passed on to him. He probably grew up with some of them, uh, drugs in his body. Uh, his little fetus growing up. That's why, like I said, these people prescribing this shit to you. Okay, keep playing. Um, God made us self-sufficient. Right? Now, you can understand the polio vaccine. vaccine and I'm not going to get into a lot of them other things because you already know the way it goes. But I will say this, his mother was on some psychotropic drugs from what I understand, allegedly, and they were very, very, very strong at that time. Okay. Uh, in 1966, the Dahmers moved to Bath, Ohio. Um, Dahmer's insecurities grew after the move and his shyness kept him away from making friends. Now, while his peers were busy listening to the latest songs, this... A uh, dude was busy collecting roadkill and stripping animal carcasses and saving the bones. Okay, that's what he was doing. Other idle time was spent alone, buried deep inside his fantasies. His non-confrontational attitude with his parents was considered an attribute. But in reality, it was his apathy towards the real world that made him appear Obedient. Dahmer continued being a loner during his years at Revere High School. He had average grades, worked on the school newspaper, and developed a dangerous drinking problem. Now, this is in high school now, right? Remember that. 
His parents struggling with issues of their own divorced when Jeffrey was almost 18 and he remained living with his father who traveled often was busy nurturing a relationship with his new wife. After high school, Dahmer enrolled at Ohio State University and spent most of his time skipping classes and getting drunk. He dropped out and returned home after two semesters. His father then issued him an ultimatum, get a job or join the army. So in 1979, this serial killer enlisted for six years in the army, but his drinking ten continued. And after just two years, he was discharged before because of his drunken behavior. Now, this is where I'm going to stop right here, because I believe he was discharged um, for a little bit more than his drunken behavior. Uh-huh. I believe... You know, the Army does so much intensive testing on individual psyche and what they are like. And sometimes they turn um, away people that have, have fit a description of killers and things like that. And they don't want them in the Army for whatever reason or any of the armed services because some about them tests make them leery of this individual. I believe a lot of that was going on with Jeffrey Dahmer as well. That's just my thought. See, now you always hear about him being dismissed from the army, right? What they don't talk about is the behavior and um, what were some of the things that this dude did when he was in the army. See, ain't nobody um, talking about that. That is a serious problem. Okay? I'm going to start right here. Uh, in 79, following his unsuccessful enrollment at Ohio State University, Jeffrey Dahmer decided, of course, you know, to go into the army. Uh he was stationed and enlisted as a medical specialist at Fort Sam Houston. And six months later, he was deployed to West Germany, where he served as a combat medic. Fellow soldiers were astonished by the fact that Dahmer had never kissed a girl and thought they would assist him in losing his virginity. One evening, they took Dahmer to Annabella's house, a well-known brothel in Vogelweg. Uh, two soldiers dragged Dahmer inside, where they introduced him to a lady. Well, Dahmer sneaked out of the brothel moments later and told his fellow soldiers that he never wants to go there again. Initially, uh, the recruits just chalked it up, uh, the incident up to his shyness, with one unidentified college remarking that Dahmer looked like a kid in a man's body feeling frustrated when he uh, realized how most men his age had experienced some kind of sexual act. What they didn't know was that Dahmer was not sexually interested in women. Dahmer himself understood this to be an inadmissible vice and initially vented his frustrations in solitary onism. Onanism. However, soon after Dahmer's uh, autoerotic activities no longer gave him uh, sufficient satisfaction. That's when his predatory urges intensified. In a 2010 interview, Preston Davis, a fellow soldier who served in a medic unit with Dahmer, claimed the notorious killer drugged and raped him inside an armored personal vehicle. Once Davis left Germany, he was replaced with uh, a dude, well, pretty much 17-year-old Billy Joe Capshaw. It said Dahmer's reign of terror towards Capshaw began the day he and Dahmer were put into a room together. Now, this is what they claim, and you, you know, I wouldn't doubt it, and I wouldn't tell. It, it, you know, I don't know how he got they got themselves in the situation, but I could see why two guys wouldn't tell. They were raped. The first time Dahmer forced himself onto Capshaw, a teenager leapt from the third floor window and managed to escape. 
He said, I had probably been raped eight to ten times. I don't know. He was trying to get, he was trying me to the bunk with motor pool rope. He was tying me to the bunk with motor pool rope. Whatever the hell. Um, I don't know if he'd been raped eight to ten times by him. Or if he said he'd been raped already since being there. That I'm not sure. Anyway, he said he took all my clothing from me. He either beat me before he raped me, or he would beat me after he raped me. Eventually, Capshaw was taken to the dispensary for a test with what they called a rape kit test to see if he was telling the truth. He said the doctors did nothing and they sent him back to his room. I was there for another 17 months with Jeff being raped and tortured. He learned 10 years later that the rape kit and the results had been discarded. They threw me to the dogs, Capsaw said. Preston Davis and Billy Joe Capsaw are now friends, abound together as the only two known survivors of Dahmer's sexual assaults. Now, due to his alcohol abuse, Dahmer's performance deteriorated, and in March 1981, he was deemed unsuitable for military service and was later discharged from the Army. Now, the interesting thing about this is you really don't know. Okay, you really don't know. You don't know if there's one of these people that said, oh, yeah, that happened to me after Jeffrey Dahmer did that to them. Or, you know, there's really, you know, truth to this. A lot of times people want to jump on the bandwagon when, um, you know, something like this happens, and especially somebody that was as notorious as Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, known to anyone, Jeffrey Dahmer was mentally uh, disintegrated. So in June 1978, he was struggling with his own homosexual desires, mixed with his need to act out of his sadistic fantasies. Perhaps his struggle is what pushed him to pick up a hitchhiker. He was 18-year-old Stephen Hicks. He invited Hicks to his father's home. The two drank. When Hicks was ready to leave, Dahmer bashed him in the head with a barbell and killed him. He then cut up the body, placing the parts in garbage bags, which he buried in the woods, surrounding his father's property. Years later, he returned and dug up the bags and crushed the bones and distributed the remains around the woods. As insane as he had become, he had not lost sight of the need to cover his murderer's tracks. Later, his explanation for killing Hicks was simply that he didn't want him to leave. He went around, when he, when I heard when he got those bones, he just chopped them up and chopped them up and then uh, put a little hole in the bag and then swung them around so the bones would go everywhere. He spent the next six years living with his grandmother in West Allis, Wisconsin. He continued drinking heavily and often got into trouble with the police. Listen to this. In August 1982, he was arrested for exposing himself at a state fair. In September 1986, he was arrested and charged with public exposure after being accused of masturbating in public. You hear me? See, this freak was allowed to do what he did. He had a almost a, a blueprint just like Jim Jones, that they um, mentally assessed when he went to the armed services and realized, yeah, he should be out there on the street too. Mm hmm. This dude. 
in September. I mean, he served 10 months in jail, but was arrested soon after his release after sexually fondling a 13-year-old boy in Milwaukee. He was given five years probation after convincing the judge that he needed therapy. After all this bullshit, he is already done. Masturbating in public, out at the damn state fair, just exposing himself at the state fair, rather. You know, these people, man. Oof. His father, unable to understand what was happening to his son, continued to stand by him, making certain he had good legal counsel. He also began to accept that there was little he could do to help the demons that uh, seemed to rule his uh, behavior. He realized that his son was missing a basic human element of conscience. Over the years, there was speculation that Jeffrey Dahmer may have been involved in the kidnapping of and murder of Adam Walsh, son of the late TV personality John Walsh. You know, I never heard that one, but that's what they said. In September 1987, while on probation now for molesting the charge, now this one to get me, he met no, 26-year-old. This is why he on probation for molesting the boy. He met 26-year-old Stephen Tomei, and the two spent the night together drinking heavily, cruising gay bars before going to the hotel. When Dama woke from his drunken stupor, he found Tomei dead. Tommy, Dama put Tomei's body in the suitcase. This one was at the Wisconsin Hotel downtown which he took to his grandmother's basement. There he discarded the body in the garbage and after dismembering it, but not before gratifying his sexual necrophilia desires. Now, unlike most serial killers who kill and move on to find another victim, Dahmer's fantasies included a series of crimes against the corpse of his victims, or what he referred to as passive sex. This became part of his regular pattern and possibly the one obsession that pushed him to kill. Killing his victims in his grandmother's basement was becoming increasingly difficult to hide. He was working at a, as a mixer at Ambrosia Chocolate Factory and could afford a small apartment. So in September 1988, he got a one-bedroom apartment in a uh, North 24th Street in Milwaukee. And by this time, I was a health inspector for the city of Milwaukee. Um, that's what I was doing at this particular time. So I think we got a call a couple times about the outrageous smell um, that was permeating from that building. And there was maybe um, a couple inspectors disperse and whatever it was a lot of dumpsters back then so a lot of people just took it as there was dead rats in the alley however this is what I want to talk about the community about how could you sit up in there and smell all that and not demand that they do something about it. The city could do something about this. Either it's a rat problem and they dead in the dumpsters, um, or they all in this neighborhood dead because there's no way in the world you should be able to smell a neighborhood while you're going through it. And that's the reputation that it was over there on 25th Street. That was the reputation of it. Um, he, you know, you go over there and it smell like dead animals. Dead rats. You know, Dama's killing spree continued, and for most of his victims, the scene was most the same. He would meet them at a gate bar, 219, or a mall, and entice them with free alcohol and money if they agreed to pose for photographs. Once alone, he would drug them, sometimes torture them, and then kill them, usually by strangulation. 
He would then masturbate over the corpse or have sex with the corpse, cut the body up, and get rid of the remains. He also kept parts of the body, including skulls, which he would clean, much like he did with his childhood roadkill collection, and often refrigerated organs, which he would occasionally eat. Now, he killed Hiram Hicks he was in uh, June of 78, Stephen Tomey, 26, in, in uh, 1987, Jerry, Jamie Doxator, uh, 14, October 87, Richard Guerrero, 25, March 88. I know Anthony Sears, he was a friend of my brother's, uh, 1989. Eddie Smith, 36. Um, Anthony Sears was 24. Eddie Smith, 36, June 1990. Ricky Beeks, July 1990. Ernest Miller, September 1990. David Thomas, September 1990. Christopher Slaughter, Strauder, February 1991. Errol Lindsay. Uh, I know Errol's sister. 1991. Tony Hughes. Who. Um, I'm familiar with his family. He was 31. And he was deaf. And he was um, killed. May 24th. 1991. Conorak Simpson Phone, May 27, 1991. Matt Turner, 20. Conorak Simpson Phone was 14, by the way. Matt Turner was 20. He was uh, June 30th, 1991. Jeremiah Weinberger, 23, July 5th, 1991. Oliver Lacey, July 23rd. July 12th, I'm sorry, 1991, he was 23. And Joseph Bradenhall, 1991. He had eight kills alone in 91. He was on a damn rampage by at this point, trying to feed his madness. Okay? Dahmer's murdering activity continued inter uninterrupted until the incident on May 27th when this fool, his 13th victim was 14-year-old Conrad Simpson phone. And this is all what you need to know about white supremacy right here. Because I know all these players involved. Okay? Early in the morning, the young Simpson phone was seen wandering the streets, nude and disoriented. When police arrived on the scene, there, there were paramedics, two women who were standing close to the confused Simpson phone. Jeffrey Dahmer and him, right? So Dahmer is sitting there telling the police... craziest thing about this remember there was two women and Jeffrey Dahmer and the police now Dahmer told police that sent us some phone was his 19 year old lover who was drunk and the two had quarreled now the police didn't look at this little boy nothing didn't have any hair on his penis, nothing nowhere around there. His genitals was very small. The police escorted Dom, and the reason why I know that is because uh, she told me one of these women standing out there. 
The police escorted Dahmer and the boy back to the apartment, much against the protest to the women who had witnessed Citizen Phone fighting off Dahmer before the police had arrived. The police found Dahmer's apartment neat, and other than noticing an unpleasant smell, nothing seemed to miss. They left Simpson phone under Dahmer's care. The white motherfucker got a chance to stay with the little boy, uh, the um, Laotian boy, because the black women were told if they don't get away from there, that they gonna go to jail. These damn officers was John Balterzak and uh, Joseph Gabrish. And I'm going to tell you what, what happened to uh, John Balterzak. He ended up being president of the goddamn police union. See, they switch all the damn criminals all around. They, they got to have the job. This whole country is all fucked up. It's fucked up with white men doing whatever the hell they want to do. And it's just that simple. So at some point, we're going to have to realize what we're up against because I don't never know nobody that ever, ever, um, uh, 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 what, what did uh, Frederick Douglass say? Power concedes nothing without a demand. Nothing. These white officers have been getting along with, get, have been able to run amok in every city in the United States. So the whole concept of policing got to be done, redone. It's out of the slave catching shit. It's got to be redone. So now when the police, John and Balterzak and Joseph Gabriel joked with the dispatcher about returning the lovers and without, within hours, Dahmer killed him. They talking about, oh, we got to go back to the office in De Laos because uh, it's a boyfriend and a boyfriend type of shit situation. And, uh, you know, well, <laughs> they left the white, the, the, the Laotian boy with the white man and he killed him and ate him. See? Mm -mm. In June and July of 91, his killing had escalated to one a week until he ran into Tracy Edwards. And according to Edwards, Dama tried to handcuff him and the two struggled. Edwards escaped and was spotted around midnight by police with handcuffs dangling from his wrist. Now, assuming he had somehow escaped from authorities, the police stopped him. Edwards immediately told him about his encounter with Dahmer and led them to his apartment. And they ain't believing it. They laughing. They joking with him because they thought he was a suspect somewhere. And they couldn't even tell that this man had just been, they didn't think, because they don't, they don't look at us as human. Right? So the horror that was on his face went unnoticed by them. And, they st and his story, according to Tracy. Tracy's in jail now. Because he ain't never been right since this. And I think he was in, he's in jail now. Um, they accused him of uh, helping or allowing some guy to jump over a bridge. So they had, it got him with second degree murder or something. And because, you know, it's, and it's sad. His, his, his whole story with this guy. This guy was never the same after you know, it really, you know. Anyway, um, he took them to his apartment. Dahmer opened his door and officers answered their fair their questions calmly. He agreed to turn over the key to unlock Edward's handcuffs and move to the bedroom to get it. One of the officers went with him. And as he glanced around the room, he noticed photographs of what appeared to be parts of bodies and a refrigerator full of human skull.
he, he they decided to place Dahmer under arrest and attempted to handcuff him. But his calm demeanor changed and he began to fight and struggle and unsuccessfully to get away. With Dahmer under control, the police began their initial search of the apartment and quickly discovered skulls and other various body parts. Along with an extensive photo collection, Dahmer had taken documenting this shit. Needless to say, both of the officers uh, were on disability um, uh, 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 because they they uh, went into shock, of course. Uh, after this, they were just trauma, extremely traumatized. No problem with them. No problem with them getting disability. No problem with them um, having the state pick up their uh, trauma. And no... But the stenographer who worked at the court, she had to type all that stuff up. She had to type it. When she applied for disability, they said no. And she couldn't work anymore behind it. She couldn't work after this case. There were a lot of people affected by this case, you guys. It went so much further than Jeffrey Dahmer. They tore the goddamn building down that he lived in. Um, it, you know, it's a nightmare. A nightmare on Elm Street, a nightmare on 25th Street. Now, what de what the details when um the details of what was found in Dahmer's apartment was horrific, matching only to his confessions of what he did to the victims. Items found in Dahmer's apartment including a human head and three bags full of organs, which included two hearts. They were found in the refrigerator. Three heads, a torso, and various internal organs were found inside a freestanding freezer. Chemicals, formaldehyde, ether, and chloroform, plus two skulls, two hands, and male genital was found in the closet. A filing cabinet that contained painted skulls, a skeleton, a dried scalp, male genitalia, and various photographs of his victims. Uh, a box with two skulls inside. A 57-gallon vat filled with acid and three torsos. The victim's identification, bleach used to bleach the skull and bones, incense sticks, because the neighbors often complain to Dahmer about the smell coming from his apartment. A claw hammer, a handsaw, a 3 8 drill, and a 1 16 drill bits. A hypodermic needle, various videos some pornographic, blood-soaked mattress and blood spatters, and to top it off, a King James Bible. So this devil was indicted on 17 murder charges, which was later reduced to 15. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Much of the testimony was based on Dahmer's 160-page confessions and from various witnesses who testified that Dahmer's necrophilia urges were so strong and he was not in control of his actions. But the defense sought to prove that he was in control and capable of planning, manipulating, and covering his crimes up. The jury deliberated for five hours, returned a verdict of guilty on 15 counts of murder, and he was sentenced to 15 life terms, total of 937 years in prison. And after he was indicted, this fucker stood up 
And he apologized for his crimes and he ended with, I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. Thank God there will be no more harm I can do. I believe that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save me from my sins. I ask for no considerations. <laughs> okay, so he was uh, sentenced to Columbia Correctional Institute in Portage. So at first he was separated by uh, the general prison population for his own safety. But <clears throat> by all reports, he was a model prisoner who had adjusted well to prison life and was self-proclaimed born-again Christian. Gradually, he was permitted to have some contact with other inmates. Now, it's ironic that most of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims was black. Okay. And um, on November 28, 1994, him and inmate Jesse Anderson, and Jesse Anderson was a man who killed his wife at the TGIF, by the way, and then told the police that a black, some black guys did it. They had on uh, ski masks, and they beat, killed, beat and killed his pregnant wife. And, um, they found him to be a liar. They didn't. He didn't want his wife no more or the baby, so he killed her in the parking lot of the restaurant. So, um, in November, on November 28, nineteen ninety four, Dahmer and his in inmate Jesse Anderson were beaten to death by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver while on a work detail in the prison gym. Now, Scarver. This dude was crazy, too, because he used to work for Wisconsin Conservation Corporation with one of my brothers. And he killed somebody on the job. I mean, really crazy, crazy. And that's why he ended up in jail. So, um, Anderson was in prison for killing his wife. And Scarver was a schizophrenic convicted of first-degree murder. Now, for reasons unknown, the guards left the three alone for 20 minutes. They returned to find Anderson dead and Dahmer dying from severe head trauma. Dahmer died in the ambulance before reaching the hospital. Now, <coughs> Somebody said, what's his legacy? <coughs> um, this, since Dahmer, there's been Frank Jude. There's been countless of cases where these police officers haven't learned a damn thing still playing the same game, still threatening um, black lives and letting white people run amok in a black neighborhood. <coughs> Excuse me. In Dahmer's will, he had requested upon his death that his body be cremated as soon as possible. But the... Um, Metal research wanted his brain preserved so he it could be studied. Um, they wanted to study his brain. So Do Lionel Dahmer wanted his to respect his son's wishes and create all the remains of his son. His mother felt his brain should go to research. So the parents went to court. And the judge sided with Lionel. After more than a year, Dahmer's body was released from being held as evidence, and the remains were cremated. Now, 
That is the story of this dude. I used to see his, uh, Earl Lindsay's sister in the mall all the time, and the whole family was so depressed. Some of them, a lot of them never got the remains back of their family members. And um, he left a big scar in this community. He did. And so, as black people everywhere... All over the diaspora, you can fake it if you want to. You know, you can try to tell yourself whatever you do to make yourself feel better. But there's a lot of extenuating circumstances and a lot of laws um, that were really smart and that have kept us in the situation we're in. And there's a lot of self-responsibility that we also have to take in conjunction with it all. And when you think of people and entities like Jeffrey Dahmer that are allowed to roam it's upside our communities, that's all the more reason why um, we have to be kind of apprehensive about who really is our friend and who want to see us dead and who want to see us alive. So, I really wanted to do that. Uh, I wanted to do it for the families of all his kills. And my condolences go out to every one of them who I know is still suffering. Still suffering. And may God be with you. And I'll see y'all in the next video.